Hello, hello, and welcome to day one of all of the announcements week. So it's currently Microsoft Build going on over in the States, and it's also the Databricks Data and AI Summit going on. So there's like loads and loads of different things going on. We'll see lots of feature announcements, lots of big news, lots of big crazy reactions from people. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about what's going on. So we've got the book of news today from Microsoft Build. So I'm going to have a quick step through, pull out the things that are data and AI-ish, basically pull out the things that I find interesting and they're actually going to affect what I do. Uh, and yeah, we'll have a quick chat about what that means and where we see it fitting in. As usual, if you are new to the channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, why not? And yeah, let me know down in the comments what you think. Are these announcements what you were expecting? Anything that you were expecting and you didn't see? And what do you think? Are you going to use them? How, how useful is it to you? So let me know. Let's dig in. Okay, so as usual, we have the big book of news, and I love the fact that Microsoft do this these days. Anytime there is a big conference with big announcements, they throw out a book of news, and we get to go and just go, what's actually going on? What's actually happening today in the world of build? So let's have a dive in. What have we got? So a few updates on the bot service, on the cognitive AI uh, kind of thing. So a few different things. So we've got a new bot service. This one I find particularly interesting. So we've had things like, um, we've had the ability to analyze time series data. So we're just getting out a massive, massive spree of data that is very, very linear and time series based. And we want to do things like find anomalies. We want to hook it up to some kind of sensor and go, that's fine, that's fine. Whoa, what happened there? Uh, so lots of interesting things we can do to dig into that stuff. And it looks like some of those services have now bundled into this Azure Metrics Advisor. So you can hook it up to a stream of events happening and then actually try and figure out what's going on. Very cool. Also video analyzer. So it's a new preview tool. So you can throw it against your videos and get various things like uh, indexes and kind of analysis of them and interesting stuff. I've not dug into that yet. I might throw it over YouTube and just see what it thinks of all of this stream of conscious thought. And yeah, interesting. Um, so there's a few other things. So like one of the major things is where we've seen Azure AI and it's just a whole mix of bot services and cognitive services and cognitive search and all these different things cropping around. Uh, they're kind of just restructuring now. So we'll see a bunch of the cognitive um, services going into a thing called Azure Applied AI Services. So expect to hear that term knocking around and kind of coming out more you know, as we see things happen. Other stuff, document translation, which kind of was previously in preview, now gone GA. Text analytics for health was in preview, it's now gone GA. Again, just kind of increasing the number of tools to go out and just help people analyze data. Obviously, health has been a massive focus over the past year. Can't think why. Um, but being able to do things like saying, here's a big block of text, and actually pulls that word, that's the prescription amount. And um, that is how regularly you take the dose. And this is actually the, the lexicology of what actually uh, that symptom belongs to a particular illness. Does it go into a giant graph of related um, body parts? All that kind of things. When you're dealing with uh, health, um, there's actually just a load of very nuanced, very kind of um, very niche <laughs> understanding of how you actually analyze that text. So having tools that are baked, that are well trained, and you can just throw that at it means anyone doing interesting innovation in the health area doesn't have to reinvent the wheel to try and pass that data to understand what it's saying. So things like that are incredibly useful in terms of building out automated, intelligent health services. Really cool. Uh, a few other things are like managed endpoints for uh, machine learning, which is very, very good. So again, we've seen kind of uh, Azure Machine Learning has some uh, fantastic tools baked into it, but it doesn't always actually play nice with security features with plugging into other things. Sometimes there's a few that you have to do manually if you're trying to make it secure. Uh, so all things in terms of making it easier to operationalize models that you build in Azure ML, super important. So it's great seeing that kind of uh, coming out and kind of more preview things there. We've got PyTorch Enterprise now as managed service, which is always a little bit weird when you see these kind of classic open source things now wrapped and provided as a service. But that's what a lot of the cloud providers do. They just make it easier to use existing tools uh, and just take away the pain of managing it, managing the infrastructure and doing all that. So I've not dug into that yet, but interesting, kind of curious to see where they go with it. So, interesting. Okay, so other bits and pieces, gonna skip down a little, lots of things. 
So one thing is Logic Apps is having a bit of a revamp in terms of how they're going to work. So Logic Apps have kind of been a really useful integration service. Like a little kind of thing, kind of almost like a higher level than things like Data Factory, which is very much big, chunky, moving data around and orchestrating data pipelines. Logic Apps much more higher. I want to trigger this every time something happens. I want to string together a lightweight string of events. That's kind of what we normally see with Logic Apps. Um, but you didn't have a lot of choice in terms of how you deploy it, how you scale it, how you manage it. Um, so it's really good to see it kind of uh, getting a bit more maturity. Um, you, know, you can actually integrate in developer tools as video, uh, VS Code, which is great. So yeah, super interesting to see what's actually going to happen in there and kind of uh, how that's going to mature and kind of people start using it for more interesting different stuff. Okay, uh, other things, lots of things with functions. Okay, Azure Data, you know, this is my space. So some things that have happened in here. So one, Azure Signups Link for Dataverse. So we've had Signups Link for things like Cosmos DB previously. And this is this uh, automated Lake etl -E type thing. So essentially, if we have something like Cosmos DB and we've got a Signups workspace, then anytime someone makes a change into Cosmos DB, it's going to filter and flow into like an intermediary uh, analytics um, pot. Essentially, it's going to make it really super easy to query it. So then when we're in Synapse, we can just go run some big, chunky, analytical style queries, and it will actually perform really well, but it will automatically stay in near real time. You know, we're usually kind of uh, three, four minutes behind is the kind of performance that we've seen previously. So the more and more different services we can do this with, the better. And so Dataverse, what used to be the kind of uh, the, the CDM, the common data model, being able to plug into various different uh, managed data stores, which is very much in the Dynamics 365, it's kind of in the Power Platform space. Being able to just natively query that directly from Synapse and have it automatically updated is fantastic. So we had a few things previously where we could query the common data model, but only if we did a few things. We had to kind of run a stored proc to create a view and then log it in, and then you know we had to kind of jump through a few hoops. So the more this is just out of the box, switch it on, start querying. Actually, the sl slicker the ex whole experience is. So that's very, very cool. Next one, you know, if you guys watch this channel a lot, you know this means a lot to me. So uh, Azure Signup Spark Pool have previously been fairly limited in that they've been on Spark 2.4. Now the switch to Spark 3.0 has a huge number of changes that make it much, much better at analyzing data, especially analyzing data that are already in analytical style data models. It makes it better at joining. It makes it better at doing cross-filtering of partitions. It makes it better at not having to tell it how many partitions that you want your data in and just have it adaptively work out a more efficient execution plan. So loads of good stuff in Spark 3. And really, really good to see that Spark pools are now in preview with Spark 3.0. This does allow a couple of other things. So it means kind of on, on Delta Lake 0 0.8, you know, so you have a little bit more functionality in terms of what you can do with Delta tables. Um, and yeah, loads of good things. And it's really, really good to see the Spark pools just keeping up and slowly moving forwards. Um, so yeah, some, some good stuff. However, we have also seen Delta Lake is now just released yesterday. On the same day this was kind of announced, uh, Delta Lake's now version 1.0. So it's kind of just, ah, uh, that catch up. It'll be fine. Okay, the other Spark thing that we've got is hardware acceleration. So if you're using things like uh, FPGAs, if you're using GPUs, this all comes down to machine learning specialist tasks. So if you're trying to do deep learning, like it's historically just so much faster if you can do that and line it up to run on a GPU, not a CPU. And so things like Databricks, we've seen that before, you've been able to have the um, ML runtime and the ML runtime can run on GPU enabled machines. So it's kind of these niche use cases. If you're doing some fairly heavy, fairly hardcore machine learning, you've got these specialist machines now so you can say, this is the type of pool I want for my particular type of task. So that is great to see. And obviously it just means it's more accessible and it's more of a realistic option when you're doing machine learning um, at scale, doing those interesting kind of use cases that need that GPU acceleration. Uh, finally, Purview now has support for MySQL and Azure database in PostgreSQL. So interesting stuff. Again, just expanding what can be pulled into Purview expanding what can actually be part of that whole ecosystem. Because again, if you've got a data governance solution and its whole point is to map your entire data estate, it needs to be able to map your entire data estate, kind of the point. So really, really good to see Purview again, adding more things 
and adding more support, more compatibility, just to make sure it gets all of those different data sources you can be using within your environment. So all good stuff to see. Uh, there's a lot of updates to Cosmos DB. Now, I don't use Cosmos DB that heavily in terms of the analytics work that we do, but some good stuff. So, you know, some partial document updates just make sense. You used to have to essentially read and then replace an existing uh, document. A document is a record in Cosmos DB. That is a JSON object. Uh, so being able to actually just flexibly just do parts of it and leave the rest of it static is always quite useful. Uh, some changes to how serverless works. And again, kind of people have seen Cosmos DB previously, you pick a size. And again, that's had some, you know, kind of fair costing. You might have to pick a fairly big size if you have a really spiky uh, workload style. So making serverless, again, more compatible with the different Cosmos API endpoints. So it's actually, you can use it more flexibly and actually just meaning it just scales itself to your workloads better, just makes sense. Now that is mainly the ones with that aren't crazy, crazy high performance ones. You're not talking about super, super specialist, big, gigantic Cosmos DB backends to your solutions. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the, the ones that are very spiky in workloads. It's very, very good to look at serverless. A few other bits and pieces. Free tier has gotten better. We love that. It's like always encrypted. It's just good. Uh, means that, you know, if you're dealing with a very, very secure environment, always encrypted is the SQL Server thing where essentially on my client side, I've got a certificate that decrypts. So my data is entirely encrypted at rest in transit all the way through the internet down to wherever I'm querying it from. And it only gets decrypted when I open it up, which just makes a lot of sense. So loads and loads of different things. Uh, what else have we got? We've got Azure Database for PostgreSQL and Azure Database for MySQL uh, are now super, super cheap and you can start using it. Um, so that's interesting. And that bakes into a thing called the Citus. Uh, and I was in a meetup with the Citus product team a little while ago. And yeah, it's super, super interesting, kind of slightly node-based way of scaling out kind of very, very large, uh, but kind of using open source uh, system, kind of if you're putting lots of data into a really, really kind of uh, high performance way. And you want to be able to uh, hook up kind of Postgres style things. Very, very interesting to check it out. So I'd go have a look at that as a potential hosting option if you're doing large scale kind of um, LTP storage kind of things. Interesting. And yeah, one of the one of the other ones we've got, uh, which I think kind of uh, was a bit of a curveball, is we've now got kind of blockchain functionality or blockchain powered functionality inside Azure SQL database. So you've got this new ledger feature, you can do ledger tables, which is cryptographic verification. So if you're trying to do actual, a very, very um, secure, very, very managed like audit trail of things that are happening, you've got the ability to do that now in SQL databases. Not had a look at it, not dug into it, but yeah, interesting. If you're thinking about going other really blockchain uh, approaches and actually having it baked into an Azure SQL database that you're using already, Kind of makes sense, kind of which means, you know, it simplifies your application infrastructure. So, yeah, interesting to look into. Okay, then the rest of us will dig down to the Power BI, Power Platform stuff. I'm going to nip over to it where I've got it already. Uh, and yeah, so a few bits and pieces here. Process Advisor is kind of generally looking at everything you're doing that with um, Power Automate and all that kind of stuff. And just generally giving some advice about it, doing some essentially analytics on your various workflow activities. Sounds interesting, not dug into it too far. Um, again, got things like Vivo, got other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so this is the one I wanted to get to. So Power BI embedded can now be embedded inside a Jupyter Notebook. And I, I am not yet sold on this. You know, so if you're writing a Jupyter Notebook, if you're writing some, you know, some Spark, you're doing some Python, you're kind of playing around with some data. Uh, a lot of the times if you're inside Jupyter, you've got a little bit of embedded kind of uh, visualization stuff you can do anyway. You can put in things like Matplotlib, ggplot, cbon, like loads of different uh, visualization tools, depending on whether you're writing Python or all these different things. So it's really interesting that kind of that kind of thing, when you're doing like that analytics, that kind of uh, ad hoc experimentation, exploration, to then have pushed that data out to Power BI, have Power BI in a model, like you know, in a particular data set, and have an embedded report that I then pull back into my Jupyter Notebook I don't yet see the point. I don't know. So definitely interesting. Definitely going to see, going to have a play and see if we can get it working and see what kind of use cases we come up with to say, actually, this is what would make that a really good idea. I just want to see if I can get that working in a Databricks notebook just because it, because I want to. Um, so yeah, interesting stuff. Fed definitely has some potential use cases. I just don't know what they are yet. Um, 
Okay, and automation APIs have been added to the Power BI Premium pipeline capability. So again, just making that DevOps story more integrated. You know, the DevOps story for Power BI has generally been a little bit lackluster. And we saw these um, deployment pipeline capabilities, essentially the ability to have dev test prod uh, workflow on top of Power BI. I mean, that just was such a great step forwards. So the ability to then hook into automation APIs and have those automatically progressed, automatically pro uh, promoted, have that triggering other things just makes so much sense. So really, really exciting to see lots of good stuff happening there. And we really want to see, again, I want to see just proper DevOps happening just for analytics as well as all the end data engineering, data science, all that kind of stuff, just because it's just good things. Uh, the final thing I wanted to go through uh, is Power BI Premium's got some more stuff to do with streaming. So we've always been able to do streaming data sets in Power BI, I've been able to do it for a long time, but it was kind of a little bit limited, kind of limited, limited how much we can plug into other stuff. Um, so actually sort of improving the ability to have those, building it into data flows, and actually having automatic aggregation, that kind of stuff on top of streaming is super, super useful. And hopefully removing a lot of limitations we've had with our live reports in the past. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely interesting. I want to dig into what uh, that is. I'll probably get some Power BI people to come and hop on the video and talk about it because I'm not a Power BI person. I'm just really confused by one particular thing. So streaming data flows will enable report creators to incorporate real-time data in a more user-friendly and faster way than currently required, which, you know, this is more friendly than currently, more user-friendly than currently required. I don't know, I don't know. Maybe probably people just don't like things to be user-friendly, but you know, generally I want it to be my requirements. I'll make it as user-friendly as physically possible. Um, but you know, that's fine. Um, interesting to see how that plugs in. Interesting to see how that fits in with other streaming architectures. So if we've got a load of Spark streaming going on and we're pushing data through a lake-based thing, but doing Delta streaming, how well does that hook into a streaming data set in terms of Power BI? How, how nice can we get that whole end-to-end -end chain looking so someone can drop a file in at the start and have it go into a live report or hook up to an event hub and have that stream all the way through and actually how nice do these things actually talk to each other and understand each other and how much telemetry can we get from the whole streaming end-to-end -end? because that kind of think about how many rows are in a micro batch. What is our rows per second processed? in each of these different hops. You have to chain them up end to end to work out, you know, your overall latency. So it'd be interesting kind of to see, it's previously been a, and then that just gets tricked into over there, but those two don't talk to each other. So I want to kind of see just what that looks like end to end now. Yeah. And then obviously there's a ton of other stuff around the Windows side of things. General Azure build is about the entire Microsoft technical ecosystem. So tons and tons of other things in there. I do encourage you to check out the rest of it, but I think they're the ones I wanted to go through today. Whew. So yeah, sorry, that was lots of talking fast. Loads, a load of things happening in build, loads of exciting uh, announcements and things. I definitely recommend go and watch the videos, go and watch the announcement videos, go and watch the AMA videos and dig into actually what the people behind this have got to say, kind of what the people who built this, uh, how they articulate it and the kind of people that they are aiming some of these services to. Don't just take my word for it. Um, but yeah, super interesting stuff. As always, let me know down below what you think of some of these announcements. Anything that's super useful. Anything that strikes out as, why, why have they built that? I just don't know. No, naming no names. And yeah, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you probably tomorrow talking about a load of announcements coming from the Databricks side of things. So, have a good one.